is gone. Go. All right. So let's talk about J.S. Mill. Okay. J.S. Mill. Now, um, Mill actually his his utilitarianism is a critique of Bentham's, um, and he is he is uh, specifically attacking this problem, the subjectiveness of it. Okay. Um, and J.S. Mill says Bentham's calculus is too subjective. It basically is suited for a pig. Whatever pleasure feels good, then it's good. Mill says this cannot be right. It's not whatever feels good is good. It's whatever we prefer as good is what really is good. And this is why J.S. Mill's utilitarianism is a lot of times classically called preference utilitarianism. Preference utilitarianism. Okay? So the basic idea is this, is yes, in some situations, especially run it through util utility calculus of Bentham's, we may end up being that lying turns out to be a really good thing. If lying ends up helping me um, uh, out quite a bit and my wife or my husband or whoever maybe doesn't find out or whoever I'm lying doesn't find out, they may live a very pleasurable life too. And it may turn out that lying is a good thing to do. And actually, uh, to be honest, would be the wrong thing to do because it would cause more displeasure. Bent or Mill says there's something just wrong with that. So he develops his preference utilitarianism where he says, it's not what we uh, want to happen, it's what we prefer as a society to have happen. And so what he basically says, in general, if you take across the board in our society, how does lying generally lead to a greater amount of happiness or a less amount of happiness? What does it in general do? Okay, so in particular situations, it might lead to greater pleasure, but generally, we see lying as a bad thing and as something that usually decreases utility. So what we want to do is find those certain preferences, certain kind of rules that in the most part lead to the greatest amount of good and we try to kind of enforce those as our moral laws. Okay, This is what he calls, he wanted to distinguish between there are higher pleasures, one that a society should try to promote, which lead to great utility, and there's lower pleasures, which people may like to do, but aren't necessarily seen as good. Okay, And he separates them as the things we prefer are called higher pleasures. Okay, And the things we kind of uh, do not prefer, we call lower pleasures. Okay. <coughs> I'll start with a lower pleasure. Some examples. Something might be this: is drinking in excess. Okay, drinking. Maybe uh, some students usually mention drugs. They would go under here. Um, maybe too much television or too much internet these days. Drinking drugs. Um, being in someone being, uh, let's see, abusive to people. It may bring people happy, but we generally see that as a lower pleasure um, from somebody. Abusive. Um, let's see, too much entertainment will put. Okay. Entertainment, um, maybe laziness, all right? Laziness, two with nine, yeah, big slide there. On and on and on, we kind of get those ideas. Now, what are the higher pleasures, according to J.S. Mill? Okay, he says things like reading books, okay, philosophy, of course, all right? Maybe going to the opera or something like this, all right? The opera, um, but also you see things such as like democracy, okay, and we have things like family, all right? Those things are also included in there under higher pleasures, things that usually bring them out the highest amount of good, okay? Um, we may, with democracy, we could have something down here, you could have something like totalitarianism, okay? It's a lower pleasure because it doesn't bring about the greatest amount of good, at least according to Mill. So he says, typically our societies prefer the higher pleasures such as these, and we should promote these. These are the good. This is what we prefer. Generally, this will bring about the greatest amount of good. Okay? These lower pleasures generally do not, though in some cases they may. Generally, they do not, and therefore we consider them as lower pleasures. Our society should try to push the higher pleasures and should try to decrease the lower ones. Okay? Now, there is one major problem that comes across. If we think about it, from what perspective, okay, would we, what societal perspective would believe that these are the higher pleasures and these are the lower? Of course, it would be Western society of the 19th century. And a lot of times, J.S. Mill is considered an elitist. So let's put that right here, okay? They call him an elitist, and which basically means this, that he has a kind of, um, an idea that he knows what's best for society, basically the Western tradition, the way we think of the world, that's what's best, and therefore, we know what's better for you know, some other countries. Because J.S. Mill, at times, when we read him, he is in favor of some of the, uh, the kind of British colonization of India, all right? Of spreading democracy there, attempting to do that. 
A lot of them accuse him of taking these Western ideals and trying to place them on others, other society, maybe other people. And therefore, he knows what's best, you don't, you better listen to me, I know what's good for you, you do not, okay? This is the elite, elitist status that he has. But to help him out, and I want to kind of, though in some sense I think this may be true, I want to help him out here a bit. Um, in his essay on liberty, okay, um, he talks about the harm principle, and that's worthy of giving us a little bit of room here. Let's just put it right here, okay? The harm principle, in which he develops this idea, okay? He basically says this, that you are allowed to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't harm anyone else, okay? Um, you are allowed to do whatever you want as long, okay, as it does not harm anyone else. What else? Okay, we'll give us a little more room here. Erase this. Okay, basically the idea is this. It kind of helps out now he's no longer an elite if you think about it. It's okay, maybe you do like drinking. Maybe you like doing drugs. Maybe you like being abusive, okay? Now this one might, we'll see. Should fall in because it probably harms other one else. Maybe abusive to yourself, all right? If you like, like watching too much TV or being lazy, okay? This, as long as you are not harming anyone else or your actions do not directly harm another person, you are allowed to do it. Go ahead. It's kind of what you do in your own house, as long as I don't harm anyone else and it's not bothering me, then you get to go ahead and do it. And what we see is this actually idea is kind of the cornerstone of what we would call uh, like classical libertarianism, all right? You're allowed to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't bother me or hurt me, okay? And I want to point out that J.S. Mill did not allow for indirect harm, such as maybe um, I'm doing something uh, that's still on my own. Let's say, you know, uh, some people may use this example of when you two, see two maybe people who are homosexual, maybe kissing in public, okay? Someone may say, well, that's harming me. J.S. Mill, I don't know if would agree with that, okay? Yeah, that would be indirect harm. Uh, you may say, well, it's harming me because my kids see it and they'll think it's normal. Well, that's an indirect harm. It's not directly harming you in a sense of physically. It, for Mill, he seems to think only direct harm counts. Indirect harm, you have to deal with on your own, okay? You explain to your child or whatever it might be. Now, some later utilitarians might include some indirect harm, but Mill does not, okay? Now, well, the reason I put in this here, um, this idea is if we add this to his higher and lower pleasures idea, we see it kind of is not so much an elitist. James Mill's not an elitist anymore. He's more what we may call a paternalist, okay? A paternalist. And what we mean by that is he's like a parent, okay? He's saying here are the general ways which I think, or at least our culture believes, will lead to a, a more pleasurable life, a better life, if you follow these things. But in the end, you can do whatever you want. It's like your parents try to help you and try to guide you in the right direction, but once you become an adult, it's up to you to do. And if you decided that you don't want to do that, you can. This is where the harm principle comes in. It says, okay, if you don't want to follow this, as long as you aren't harming anyone, then you are fine to go do whatever you want. Go off and be the heroin addict or whatever, if that's what you want, as long as it hurts no one else. And so that's why I think it's better to see J.S. Mill more as an early paternalist rather than elitist, okay? Um, now there's still plenty of questions that are open, such as, you know, this harm principle only, you know, is it only applied to individuals, an individual situation? Or is this something we have to take in and add to, you know, the general public as a whole? Such as, what if it comes to a military action, okay? And it's talking about, you know, a just war in which we may have to attack someone and kill, you know, maybe innocent people or some innocent lives are at stake. Do we apply this to it as well? If that was the case, we would be in trouble, okay? I don't think Mill means that, but this needs to, this harm principle also needs to be explored a bit more. Okay? Um, but in the end, I think preference utilitarianism, J.S. Mill, or at least what we call it, preference, seems to be a better fit um, than Bentham's, or at least it deals with the problem of pleasure a bit better, though as we'll see, there are still problems with it. Um, in our next lecture, what we're going to do is deal with three major problems utilitarians must face. Take a look at from preference utilitarian's perspective, and take a look from hedonist perspective, and see how they answer it. And sometimes both of them might not be able to answer. Okay, but for now, that's the end of this lecture. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.